for you and I lay my life before you. Oh, how I love you, Spirit, I adore you, and I lay Before we have our opening prayer, we'll sing Precious King. Precious memories of seen angels sent from somewhere to my soul. How Let us bow. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this first day of the week, this new opportunity that you've given us this morning to come and worship you, the only true and living God. Father, we're so thankful for the church here in his name. We're thankful for all the good works that, that we do. Father, we ask you to be with our area wide youth meeting this morning and this afternoon, Father, that much good will come from it. And Father, we ask you to be with the areas and bring us the rest of the day. It's in your son's name we pray. Before Barry comes to speak to us, we'll sing I Love My Savior too, number 825, if you need a book. Uh, if not, why don't we stand at this time? First and last one. <clears throat> Number 825. 
Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, on earth I go. Closely to Him I cling, let sing still flow. I love my Savior Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Again with a question. Do we truly appreciate who we really are to God? I mean, to one another, that sometimes we get that. To ourselves, sometimes we get that. But who we truly are to God? I think sometimes we we get a little bit too much invested in ourselves and forget who we are to God, or we get a little too devaluing of ourselves when it comes to God. You go back to the text in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God. You could put a period there and just contemplate on that for a few moments. Moses, in writing this, did not take time to try to explain who God is, what his attributes are, what he's like. He just went with and implied he's the source. In the beginning, God. Anyone with really, truly, I don't mean this to be disrespectful anyway, but anyone with any common sense and intelligence to know there has to be something behind all of this order that we have in design that we have in the world around us. He is literally the source of all. As you hold your ribbon there in Genesis chapter 1, we know that he is the source from other passages. You go over to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, and of course this is a reference to the Ten Commandments that were given and a reference to keeping the Sabbath day. He says, for in six days the Lord God made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and here it is, all that in them is. And he rested on the seventh day. All that in them is was created in that literal six, 24-hour period days that we understand today. Each one of those in the creation in the morning and the evening was the first day. The Hebrew word yom can mean long periods of time if some tried to make that out to be, but every time in Scripture when there's a number put in front of it, it always means a literal 24-hour period of time. Is that too hard for God? Actually, He could have spoken it all into existence all at once if He wanted to, but this is the way He chose to. Let's just listen to Him. But He is the source of all things. You go to the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verses 1 and following. He is the source. And if He is the source, then that begs the question, do we respect Him as such? When you say, God, what do you hear? That phrase has become so flippant that that anything and everything can, can reference someone spouting off Oh my God. That 
that's not the way this is supposed to be. That shows a lack of respect for who he really is. One of those commandments under the Old Testament was not to take the Lord's name in vain, not to use it flippantly in such a way. But thinking about this idea of who we really are, I came across this quote from a Christine Marie. She's a PhD. is on psychology today. She's quoting from a German philosopher. The German philosopher's name was Immanuel Kant. He says he's considered, she said he's considered to be the father of the modern concept of dignity. Think about that, the modern concept of dignity. He argued that all human beings have equal intrinsic worth and inherent deserve to, inherently deserve to be treated with dignity. Kant explained that to treat people with dignity, they should never be used as a means to an end. I think there's some weight to that statement. And and though that quote is well worth reading and contemplating, someone said that much earlier, didn't they? In essence, who did? Moses did in our text. Go back with me now to Genesis chapter 1. And let's start with verse 26. Genesis 1, 26, and we'll read through verse 28. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So Mr. Kant and his quote of giving dignity and showing dignity and not using people as a means to an end, but seeing them, he would go on to say, seeing them as the end themselves. I don't quite agree with that, but understanding who they are and appreciating who they are, they're created in the image of God, just like me. Each one of us we have had and will continue to have in our society and in our world a plague of something called low, and you could probably continue that, couldn't you? Self-esteem. It's caused people to do things they didn't really want to do to impress people who really don't care. Low self-esteem. What is God saying? You're made in the image of Him. And so as we look at this, when God made man, we first note that we were made in the image of God. That's the first part of verse 26. God, in the plural sense of this conversation that they're having with the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Word, they're having this conversation, we're going to create in our image. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. To do so, it sets us apart from all other creation that was made within that six-day uh, period that we talk about of creation. We are set apart. We are different. We are not just a little higher than or an advanced evolution of, we are the crown creation of God. Thus, we have intrinsic value. Each one of us, every one of us. Having said that, one author says, so being created in the image of God means that all human life has the thumbprint of God on them so that every life is sacred. Hear this, even the malformed one. Every life is sacred, even the malformed one. We have culture, we have society that has, and it's not anything new, mind you, that if you can know that the child's going to have some problem, just what? Get rid of it. They totally devalue the intrinsic value that God's thumbprint has placed upon that child, even in the womb. We devalue life because we've set ourselves up to be God in many cases, but we were made in the image of God. Another author says, we are not told that man was made in the image of angels. No. Nor are we told that we are, or the angels were made in the image of God, but we were told that man was made in the image of God. So look at that. It sets us apart even from the angels. Angels are definitely created beings. All things were made by God. There was not anything made that wasn't made. Angels were created beings. And brothers and sisters, hear me now, we're not going to become angels one day. That's not biblical. That never was biblical. And I hear me on this, we don't want to be angels either. Why? When angels sinned, they were cast out of that place that was prepared for them, the devil and his angels, that place called hell. 
But Jesus has prepared a place for us. A place that he refers to as many rooms, many mansions. A place where we can be with him. Jesus, friends, did not come to this earth to die for angels. He came to this earth to be a sacrifice for you and for me. There was no sacrifice, never will be a sacrifice for the angels that sinned. They were just cast out. So therefore, why would we want to be even thinking of ourselves as becoming angels one day? Maybe you saw it in a movie one day, maybe. I don't know. But that's not reality. Another author says, The assertion that man is made in God's image shows that each man has true dignity and worth. Stop there for a moment. As I contemplate this author's words, I was looking at this. I have to step back and ask myself, how often do I mess that up? It's, it's easy for me to see the great value and intrinsic value that my mother, my father have, my wife has, my children have, maybe even I have, uh, some friends that I have. But, but what about every individual? What about that person who you, you know, who I say you know, you assume, we, we assume that this person is just out to take advantage of someone to get a little money, maybe to, to take care of a of an addiction that they have or something along those lines. But even that soul to God has what? Intrinsic value. Jesus died for that soul. He wants that soul to be saved. Would you say, come sit with me in my pew while we worship God together? Or would you say, what are you here for? We have to be careful with that, don't we? We're made in the image of God. The author goes on to say, as God's image bearer, he merits infinite respect God's claims on us must be taken with total seriousness. No human being should ever be thought of as simply a cog in a machine or a mere means to an end. Worldliness teaches you, carnality teaches you to get what you can out of someone else, not be what you can for someone else. That's Christianity. That's Christ-likeness. Jesus emphasized the value placed on man, didn't he? How do we do that? How do we see that Jesus shows us the emphasis of, of the value that each one of us have? If you would, just go with me over to the Philippian letter, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, very familiar passage, but note this in the context of being made in the image of God. God created us, made us in the image of him. And so he says here in the Philippian letter, starting with verse 5, chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, who, or rather, who in being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but note this, made himself of no reputation and took upon him, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, he did this, of course, verse 8, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also, having highly exalted him and had given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in the things of heaven and things of earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. But look at what he did again. He is in the beginning. We know Jesus to be the Word, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. 14 specifically said the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Only happened once, and that was Jesus. We know that to be the case. In that same text, we quoted earlier that all things were what? Made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. That includes you and I being made in the image of God. Does that mean that God looks like we do? Well, that's an interesting thing because if you look around the world in which we live, there are a whole lot of different looking things called humans. But maybe there is some similarity. I don't know. I think it's a little deeper than that. But there's a lot of confusion as to what that actually means. I do believe that we are in, in a spiritual being as well. That's who we truly are. That's the part of us that will live on through eternity. Nevertheless... As I look at this, the one who made me in his image made himself in a very similar image, just like you and me. But why? To become obedient unto death. Why would Jesus allow himself to be humiliated, made like his creation, 
to come to this earth and die, he did so for you and for me. He did so so that we can be with him. He did so to become the sacrifice for my sin so the sin can be taken away and I don't have to bear that burden. That tells me how valuable I am to God. And that, therefore, I don't want to do anything to shame or humiliate or to tarnish His good name. Do you? When we teach things that He doesn't teach, Bind things that he doesn't bind. Loose things that he doesn't loose. We go on and on with illustrations. We're not faithful to him. We treat him as an afterthought. When he put you and me on the pinnacle and said, I'm going to show you how valuable you are by going to this earth. By dying that death. He did not choose to be made in the image of the angels, did he? He chose to be made in the image of you and of me. How do I know that? Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, starting with verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. He didn't put the angels in that position. He never had that power and that position given to the angels. It wasn't set apart for them. But in a certain place, verse 6, testifying, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Psalm chapter 8, verse 5. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Think about that. What are we? What are we that this infinite being, God, would take time to stop and consider me? Or the Son of Man that thou visitest him? The Son of Man, this creation of him, that he's going to come and, and walk alongside us? Why would uh, you, you take some elaborate leader and king of some nation, sovereign nation in this world, and he wouldn't belittle himself to be seen among the peasants. But Jesus did. The King of kings and Lord of lords emphasizing to you and to me. He was not made in the image of these angels. No, verse 7 says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, for thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands, and hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he hath put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see, not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That's how he was made lower than the angels, not because he's walking among us here on this earth and it's an, it's an elevation type thing. No, he's lower than the angels because he suffered death. Angels don't die. Angels don't die. They can be separated from God, but they don't die. He chose to robe himself in flesh, became obedient, tasting death. What does he say? For every man. Verse 9. And so, yes, he didn't choose to be made in the image of angels. He took upon himself flesh in order that he might die for us. Now look at verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect or complete through suffering. He is the captain of our salvation. He is the source of our salvation. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He shows us great value that we have. Now, we cannot be separated from that image which God has given to us being created in his image. We will always be in the image of God. That does not mean that we cannot be separated from his presence and his blessings. And that will happen to those who are unfaithful. How do we know that? We know that from scripture, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. God's chosen people, the people that he handpicked out of all the races and nations of the world, he said of this nation because of the covenant he made with Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, these are my people. What did he say? He said to them, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your Israelites, God's chosen people, the separated ones, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face that he will not hear. See, as we look to the New Testament, 1 Timothy, 1 Peter, rather, chapter 3 and verse 12. 
the Lord's face is against going to do evil. I don't like the sound of that, but it's a reality that I must face. If in, in evil, it, evil needs to be defined biblically, not personally, not culturally. Evil needs to be defined biblically. What does God call evil? You know the number one thing specifically that God calls evil in the New Testament? False teaching. It's evil deeds. And His face is against them to do so. There are multiple reasons why we should long to live up to the image that God has set forth for us and put before us. The ultimate one is that of love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now by its faith, hope, love, the greatest of these is love. You also see that same idea as you look to John chapter 14 and verse 15. If you love me, what's he say? Keep my commandments. First John chapter 4, verse 19 as well. Why do we love him? You may not know the reference, and even if I've mentioned it, but we know the end of that statement. We love him because church. We, he first loved us. And that love for us was manifest and that he came to this earth to show your value not to live in sin and carnality and fleshly worldliness, but to live a faithful, devoted life to him. A, here's the hard one. Oh, this one hits barrier right between us. The self-denying life for him. Don't say you love the Lord until you're willing to truly deny your likes, your desires for the world. He shows us what love really looks like. John chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. Greater love is no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. What? If. Condition. If you do whatsoever, I command you. And why would he ask that of us? Because look at what he did for you and for me. Look at the gifts and the blessings of just ultimately being created in his image. Not said of any other creation. And there's some majestic creatures that God has made in this world around us, aren't there? Some that just, they're awe-inspiring just to see the mass that they have and their size, the, the great blue whale, the elephant, or the beauty of some of those large cats. Vicious as they are, beautiful. Some of God's creations, mountains and mountain ranges. You may like what the, the beach and the ocean and how, it, how beautiful it is. Both can be treacherous. There's still beauty in them. But again, Jesus died for me. He died for you. And so we're made in the image of God, verse 26. But also in verse 26, the latter part of the verse, second point, we're made to oversee his creation. He gave us that value, yes, but he also gave us a responsibility. As you go back to the text, look at verse 26. He says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Did you see, he didn't leave anything out. All of this. Now, God has made man to have dominion before he created man. He didn't create and say, you know, I think I need somebody to watch over this and take care of this. He had a plan for that in the first place. And as we look at that, Kyle in his commentary says, God determined to give to the man about to be created in his likeness the supremacy, not only over the animal world, but over the earth itself. And this agrees with the blessing in verse 28 where the newly created man is exhorted to replenish the earth and to subdue it, to bring it under control. There's a level in which we can't do that. I understand. There's a level in which that's beyond our capabilities. You can't step out in the middle of a tornado and say, stop. And that tornado is going to listen to you. And if you try it, at least let us get a video so that people can remember you. It's not going to work. But I think back to some of those great creatures that we were talking about earlier and how they've been made to do man's bidding. I have said this in something as simple as riding a horse. A horse is a magnificent creature, isn't it? Beautiful creature. And has been 
tied to work and to progress throughout the years, even war. And you go back in the Old Testament, the, the nations that had chariots of iron, they were afraid of those nations that had chariots of iron. Well, you know those chariots didn't pull themselves. They had horses involved in that. But you know as well as I do that you take the average 1,500 to 2,000 pound horse, if that creature had the intelligence at least half the intelligence of a human being, you would never ride them nor subdue them. Right? The man has got them, gotten them to do many things. And we can go on and on with that illustration, but you've heard maybe in our culture the term Mother Earth. You heard that? Have you, have you ever actually looked into what that comes from, what that means, that idea behind that Mother Earth? I did, and, and this is what I came across. The term Mother Earth comes from the idea that the Earth is considered as the source of all its living beings and inanimate things. That's very ungodly. That's not a term that we should be embracing. Not to say that we should disrespect creation, the Earth. But the Earth is not the source. That's evolution. That's humanism gone to seed. No, that's not the way it is. As a matter of fact, if you look at Romans chapter 1, Paul addressed some of that mindset, how they worship and serve the creature rather than the creation. Why? Because they didn't like to retain the knowledge of God. But he tells them that the secret things of the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen by the things that are made. We can know by this creation that there had to be a hand behind this. And if you'll note, Paul said by inspiration, those who deny that are without excuse. There's no excuse to not believe that there is a God. But you see, people don't like to retain the knowledge of God because of the responsibilities and things that go along with that, and the selflessness and the sacrifice that goes along with that. And so God gave them over to reprobate minds, to do things that are not natural, even the abuse of the human body. Women with women, men with men. They're in that context. Why? Because it goes against nature itself. It's not the way God, who created it, set things up. And he tells us to have this dominion. The word dominion, which Moses wrote, means to rule over, dominate, direct, lead, control, subdue. Sometimes it's used in a sense of governing an entity, people, or government considerable force, or, or, with considerable or forceful authority. And they, going back to the first part of that definition is what we see in Genesis 1.26. To rule over in the sense of to take care of, of, to subdue, to dominate, but in the, the, there are other senses in the scripture where it's used to use like in a military sense. They subdued a nation. They dominated over this nation or they had this dominion over another nation. Genesis 126 and 28, Isaiah 14, 2 and 6, if you want to look at those. But this continues with the idea that we need to grasp in looking at this. Because we tend to elevate ourselves too much or devalue ourselves too much, let's get a balanced approach. God is saying in this that we are to be stewards with what he's given us. Now, how do I know that? Look at Genesis 2.15. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. The Garden of Eden has been created. Adam has been put there. But look at what he says in verse 15. And the Lord took, Lord God took, the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. To what? To dress it and to keep it. What does that tell you? He had responsibility. Here's your stewardship. Adam, I'm putting you in this paradise. And that's literally what it was. But you have to take care of this. You have to use this correctly. We know, of course, man didn't. The stewardship is definitely implied. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10 says, A wise man considers his animal. What does that mean? If you're working that mule or that ox, then we don't do that anymore. We drive a tractor most of the time now. But if you were working back in the day with an animal of that nature, you would take care of that animal, wouldn't you? You don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. You feed them. You care for them. Why? Because that animal is helping take care of you. A wise person does that. Be, be, be a good steward in this. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28 as well. And 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 4 2 says that stewards must be found faithful. A steward must be found faithful. What is a steward? 
It's someone who's been entrusted with something that belongs to someone else. And that's exactly what we are. We've been given this world on which to live by a God who wants us to take care of it. Subdue it. Our dominion is a gift, but it also shows something. The fact that this dominion that he puts upon us, this opportunity for this responsibility he puts upon us, it shows that we have, are you ready for it? Ability. We can do this. He would not ask it if we couldn't. And another commentary says those capabilities or capacities rather of right thinking, right willing, right acting or of knowledge, holiness and righteousness in which man resembles God qualify him for dominion and constitute him Lord over all creation that are destitute of intellectual and moral endowments. The creation around us is destitute of those things. Those little animals, those pets that we sometimes have, they can do some amazing things and make you think that they're actually really in tune with you and they understand exactly and they're reasoning out. No, they're instinct. They are practicing instinct. God gave this to man, not to those animals. I don't mean no disrespect in that. That's just a reality. Hence, he says, whenever man enters, whenever man enters, he makes his sway to be felt. He contemplates the objects around him, marks their qualities and relations, conceives and resolves upon the end to be attained and endeavors to make all things within his reach work together for its accomplishment. When was the last time you saw something to the equivalent of the entire state building being built by apes? Now, termites can make some very amazing mounds. Or, or here in Mississippi, we know about the fire ants, don't we? I mean, overnight, they can really amaze you what they can build, but not to the not, not what man can do. He didn't make them that way. How well are we living up to the image potential that God has created in us as individuals? Then finally, we're made to bear fruit. In the latter part of that text, verses 27 through 28, it's talking about being fruitful and multiplying, replenishing the earth. God made man and woman perfectly suited one for the other. A lock and a key. A lock without the key is worthless. The key without the lock is no good. God made it perfect. Modern carnality seeks to pervert this simple truth. Jesus sealed the validity as he states in Matthew 19 verse 4. In the beginning, he made them male and female. The world can tell you all at once that there is, there never will be the science to back it up. There are only and will only ever be two genders. Because God made it that way. And because it makes sense. Because it's logical. Because it's natural. Because it's the only way that we're ever going to reproduce and subdue the nation. God in his Procreation here. The idea of procreation has been said of him to the nurture, the procreation and nurture of the continuing generations of mankind upon the earth as God ordained privilege and commandment, Kaufman would say. Replenish does not envision a repopulation of the earth, but the spread of some of mankind throughout all the earth or all the world. There is no record of previous populations that sometimes are alleged from at that are written, uh, that is written here to have existed prior to humanity. This was the beginning of this. God wanted man to continue man. And he wants man to keep on continuing man until he comes back and ends all of this creation and takes us home, wherever that home may be. Psalm 127, 3 through 5 on that note. God has always wanted his faithful to fill and subdue the earth but to fulfill and subdue the earth after him. What is the purpose of man? To fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole of man. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Numbers are more than just numbers then, aren't they? He would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 
1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. The innocence of our offspring, including those in the womb, are never forgotten by a loving father, though many earthly fathers and mothers are willing to toss them aside. We need to pray for tender hearts of repentance that would be moved with compassion, realizing we're made in the image of God, realizing that we're made to oversee the creation, realizing that we're made to bear fruit. Bearing fruit is contextually appropriation, absolutely. But we're also told in a spiritual sense that we're to do the same thing. James 1.27, practicing that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and the widows and keep oneself unspotted from the world. Don't take for granted the amazing reality that we all, even our enemies, were created in the image of God. He's still counting on us to be the overseers of this creation. But can I see this, can you see this concept the spiritual realm we're to conform to the image of God right, as Christians be not conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12 verse 2 we're to oversee as stewards the new creation, his church that is to be nurtured to be admonished Acts 20, 28, the elders were encouraged to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Hebrews 3, 13, were to exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And we are to bear fruit to his glorification. Let your light so shine before men. You may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Any branch that doesn't abide in Jesus, he says, is going to be pruned. It's going to be cast out. Luke chapter 15. Do you abide in the vine? Are you in Christ Jesus this morning? You were created in his image. Are you conforming to that image as a child of his in obedience to the gospel? If we can help in any way. You need to come back home. You haven't been bearing fruit as you should. Something along those lines. We're going to sing this song of encouragement. Will you come now as we stand as we sing? What a really good worship today. Appreciate all of you being here. Uh, good Bible classes, two good sermons. I don't have any additional announcements other than just to remind you what Alex talked about. We need these people to help get up these tables and chairs for uh, this afternoon. Just remind you at 5 o'clock of a whole bunch of people in here. So if you can bring some sweets and so forth, uh, well, that would be great. If you haven't had the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, it's been left prepared in the library and somebody will... Uh, lead you in prayer back there so if you make your way back there as we begin this song Thank you. before we're just missing prayer we'll sing one verse of pure and all <clears throat> 
Bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us another opportunity to study another portion of thy word. Forgive us of our many sins and trespasses. Be with those who are sick and afflicted. And be with our family and friends that are hurting. Comfort those who have recently lost loved ones in a way that only thou can through thy word. Go with us now as we depart this place. Dismiss us in thy love and tender mercy and help us to know the truth because the truth will set us free. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.